Hi, and welcome to A Critical Dragon, where I talk about narrative in film, television, and in books. And today I am joined by Malazan co-creator and author of the Malazan Empire novels and the novels to the pa uh, path to ascendancy, uh, Ian C. Esselmont. Hello. Hello. Glad <laughs> to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Well, uh, it is absolutely brilliant to see you, Cam. Um, and I just wanted to uh, do a quick interview with you at this point because you have perhaps unknowingly signed up to do a series of interviews and, and talks with myself and Philip Chase because we're going to go through some of the novels of the Malazan Empire and the, the path to ascendancy novels. So thanks for, for volunteering to do that. Oh, oh dear. <laughs> well, that would be great. <laughs> well, the ink's dry in the contract now. You can't back out. Um, so I thought what would be nice is um, because we're going to do this series of interviews later where we're going to go through each, uh, a couple of the, the different books, maybe one at a time or do a couple at once where we can actually delve into each novel. We try and use this time to talk a bit more about, say, the background and, and where you were coming from, both in your writing and, and the creation of the, the world, because obviously you created this with... Uh, Steven Erickson, uh, the whole of the, the Malazan universe. And then there were uh, other players who, you know, took on various characters. And through them, you and Steve had developed various plot lines. And then at a certain point, you kind of divided up the world to, to tell the stories that you wanted to, to tell. So the first thing I wanted to, to talk about, to ask you about, was the fact that you were the gamer before Steven Erickson, like you're, you're the one responsible for all of this. I get to blame you. Blame me. Uh, was I had introduced him to gaming. I'd been gaming for some time. Yes. At the high school and university. Uh, and um, I introduced him to that uh, when we met uh, on an archeological site. Uh, and one summer in uh, Western Ontario, but he had already been writing fantasy and, and I had already been writing fantasy as well. So mm -hmm. we've been doing both uh, before then. Uh, and uh, so we got to share all kinds of uh, shared interests and uh, meshed and met up in a lot of ways. And um, he took to it. Uh, well, it was a bit awkward at the beginning. <laughs> Didn't go well. <laughs> I, th I think anyone who's ever played a role-playing game uh, that is in person as opposed to like a computer game variant. Uh, computer game variants are very different, but anyone who has ever tried playing it uh, with people will understand that awkwardness of the first time playing and going, well, what do I do here? I'm like, okay, I just hit it with my ax. Or was that yeah. not the problem that... Yeah. Oh. Uh, reacting in all too human a way, perhaps. And... <laughs> and when confronted by danger, running away. <laughs> so that makes perfect sense. That's exactly what you would do in the real world. And so uh, it was uh, a lot of fun to sort of organize and get together the idea of um, uh, slipping into a fantasy setting and then creating the whole narrative together, mm -hmm. right? back and forth. And uh, the, the gaming just set, set all that up. Yeah. Uh, just to warn you, either my internet or your internet is a little tiny bit patchy, so occasionally the, the signal might drop out. So um, I'll try and warn you if it happens. But uh, but you were you were writing fantasy before the RP, uh, the gaming with with Steve. So how much of that has ended up being in the novels of the Malazan Empire, or was that something that was entirely different and that's in a notepad somewhere in a lockbox buried underneath a, an abandoned school? Yeah, it's completely different. It's more a um, uh, learning process and teaching, trying to teach oneself and uh, looking at models and trying to imitate them and uh, see how they do the things that they do and uh, trying to get trying to learn the chops but who then uh who then were the, the sort of the fantasy influences that before meeting steve before talking about any of that stuff before a lot of 
that happened in the, I suppose, the, the 1980s. Who were you reading that inspired you to write fantasy? Right. Well, um, a lot of uh, Howard, Robert E. Howard, uh, and uh, Lieber, or Cider, mm -hmm. or Lieber, depending on uh, which continent you want to use for pronunciation. Um, and uh, sort of the, the rest of the usual fantasy list of, uh, uh, of authors who were all well known at that time. Um, so Tolkien, Donaldson, um, but yeah, and pretty much everybody. I mean, it was it was very eclectic and uh, very uh, sort of sunk into the genre very deeply. Well, okay, here's a, a question that might settle uh, an argument or two. Had you ever read Michael Moorcock? Oh, lots of Moorcock, yes. <laughs> because this, and, uh, this is one of those things, it keeps coming up about a certain character in, in the Malazan universe who has a certain sword, and everyone goes, oh, but that's, that's just like Moorcock. And Erickson... Uh, brackets the artist and author formerly known as Steve because I've killed him off and removed him from reality um, is has always said I never read Murcock and so it's always been this oh well he never did you go yes but there was another person involved in designing that world so definitively now is perhaps that sword slightly based on something you may have seen in Murcock well, um, this was, it came out of our gaming, all right? That weapon, right? It was created for, for, uh, for a game. And so at that point, I had no compunctions about doing a little homage uh, <laughs> to a certain other magical sword. I'm sorry, I love it when it's, it's an homage when you go, yeah, I actually just shamelessly stole it. It's, it's an homage. <laughs> It's not exactly the same. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that was, um, I think that's going to settle some internet arguments. Um, and that's, you know, that is something that I, I've been very privileged to become aware of is obviously in meeting with you and the, the times that we've met up, say, at ICFA in Florida, or, you know, when we've corresponded, I've gotten to see a, a, a different side to the Malazan universe uh, than what most people commonly get because you very rarely do interviews and you very rarely do sort of social media things. We're a little bit isolated up here in, uh, in Fairbanks, Alaska. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but it's still technically like, a, it, it's not like you're living in an igloo. Technology no. still exists. Yeah, well, you should see how bad our provider is. <laughs> um, so who was, uh, who was the first one to read Glenn Cook? Or was this kind of just when you were out on a dig? And, um, because I never understood the sequencing of this. You were gaming. Uh, you met up with, with Erickson out on a dig. The two of you sort of hit off a friendship and were talking. And obviously, you've just now said that you were both writing and attempting to write various forms of fantasy. So there was a lot to talk about, but um, how really did that progress? Like, uh, was it, I've just read this book, you have to read it. And then he was saying, oh, I've read this one, you have to read that. Yeah, there's a lot of that. Uh, you know, oh, this, this is great, you gotta see this. You don't know so-and-so. And so we shared a lot of what we knew. And I had uh, been given uh, Cook's Black Company by my gamer friends at the university who are uh, also avid readers of fantasy and science fiction. And uh, so I had, I gave that to Steve. Uh, and then he showed me um, Kane, the Kane series, uh, Carl Edward Wagner's stuff, which I hadn't, I hadn't even know existed. Which I uh, have up here. <laughs> yeah. And so we, we shared influences there. Yeah. Oh yeah. Because um, it, Looking at the the breadth of what the the two of you created, um, it's clear there's no one influence. It's not it's not a Tolkien esque world. It's not a 
you know, one author world. It is very diverse in all of the different things that you kind of approached. So it, it's quite difficult for someone like me to try and pin down exact influences. Um, well, they, they don't all come from the, the, our fantasy reading, of course. They're also from our academic experience and from reading um, outside of the, the genre in uh, literature and literature courses uh, that we had both taken. Um, I was a uh, student for far too long and took far too many courses in uh, various literatures from various periods and classical uh, and you name it. Uh, and so there's, uh, for example, you could say there's a lot of, uh, there's some Kipling in, in uh, the, our world and uh, various other um, authors from the 19th century, 18th century. Yeah, um, Count of Monte Cristo is uh, definitely crops its its head up in places. Elements of the Three Musketeers, and mm -hmm. those like that they all play into that whole idea of the adventure group, and you know that's that's part and parcel really of how adventure stories happen. Um, oh, yeah. um, well, these other authors we mentioned, they're drawing upon uh, their own um, reading readings through their life yeah um but it's it's certainly it's a a very strange uh fantasy world for for some readers to approach because it seems that neither you nor nor Exxon really played by the rules um like for a start your fantasy maps in places actually make a lot of geographical sense and you should know the rule in fantasy is these things shouldn't make any sense we we hope that most of the uh, most of them do um, that, that we might have messed up a few places, uh, but I think Steve is responsible for most of the geography in the maps. Not all of it, but uh, a fair 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 bit of it. Uh, he's a much better draftsman than I am. So. so if there's a problem with the maps, it's definitely Erickson. Excellent. Yep. We'll That's right. That down. Down. Yeah. <laughs> but people have pointed out, you know, that this why is this river parting here? You rarely see rivers bifurcate like that and uh, it's that's true it's rare uh but there are things here even here on earth that are uh, that are odd that don't wouldn't wouldn't strike you as common sense like um <clears throat> in uh thailand on the uh border with uh like cambodia and laos there's of course the mekong and at certain times of the year that river will flow backwards so people, because, you know, certain tides are strong enough to, to pull that, make that river run backwards inland. I was completely and utterly unaware of that. Yeah, and you people would, if you did that in a fantasy novel, a lot of uh, readers would just go, oh, that's just bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> well, wasn't that one of the, the big civil engineering projects in the U.S. was basically to reverse the flow of the river in Chicago into the yeah. lake? That, yeah, that river now flows backwards. <laughs> <laughs> the, the other thing about that is, is obviously for St. Patrick's Day, they dye it green and you go, well, could you not dye it blue the rest of the year? Yeah, please. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, that's just one example of, of that. And, and then we tried also to, to make sense as far as uh, the uh, political boundaries and cultural boundaries of, of the regions. Um. Now, obviously, like a lot of uh, a lot of your books focus more on the Crimson Guard uh, and a lot of the characters from the Crimson Guard and what they're involved in, as opposed to um, a lot of Erickson's novels are much more focused on uh, the specific Malazan armies. Um, when it came to to carve up the world, obviously, you you had shared all of these characters. You had you had played. Uh, characters in the Crimson Guard, you had played characters in the Malazan Army, and, and so had Steve. So in, in trying to find those aspects that you wanted to keep and that he wanted to keep and to, just to divide up such a huge world and all of these different stories, how did that sort of go about? Um, right, well, when we were going to go our separate ways, we decided, uh, we sat down and just made a list of uh, what 
areas we we would like to explore and what which narratives we would like to pursue and he did his list and i did mine and i don't know we had about 10 items each something like that uh and um we just agreed that that's how in the future those are the projects that we would pursue you see now this is disappointing because i thought steve would have challenged you to a fencing tournament you would have challenged uh, him to an armrest and then eventually you went well we'll just flip a coin over <laughs> there was very there was very little overlap um and or any disagreement over the list actually um and it, and it wasn't uh, something that we had to keep to either of course we just a gentleman's agreement so. yeah and well i mean the world is big enough that yeah th there's ample room not only to tell all of these different yeah. fantasy stories but um you could tell different stories within the world uh horror stories or um action stories character portraits like and that world is so broad but also mm -hmm. so deep and well realized that you know there, there's plenty of room for everything so mm -hmm. that wasn't really what i was kind of getting at it was more um it, it's fascinating because obviously there were some characters that you grow attached to and you know giving those up uh, even though you completely yeah. trusted the other person to do well by them you're like but that's my baby i rolled him up i was very little worry about about i mean if um if i finished if c finished a piece or i finished a piece uh that was that character's run so to speak and then if if they got to be picked up and seen somewhere else later on that would that was fantastic it's just a bonus uh and sometimes i was surprised at uh the characterizations and and uh, steve also equally so i i imagine um well i wouldn't have done that but okay <laughs> but you know i I got a real sense that this was what it was like when you were gaming, because if someone took over and was using them as an NPC and then they turned up when someone else was GMing, then you'd go, that, that's not how that character would act. And is like, yeah, well, yeah, it no, is. No, that's the point. We never did that. Oh. I can't, I can't recall a time when one of us actually used the other's rolled characters. That, I don't think that ever happened. But did you use... Uh, NPC characters that sort of just were in the general pool to pick up and use for uh, for storytelling. Uh, around, they might have been around. Yeah. Um, yeah. I just maybe I'm mistaken, but I can't I can't think of that. Uh, usually, when when we were gaming, that my characters were mine and his were his, and that they were completely separate. Um, <laughs> I'm just one of the. I, one of the questions that had come up about a lot of the Malazan stuff was someone had asked about the Malazan naming conventions and how, you know, very, uh, there, there was there a co, uh, consistent or coherent approach to characters getting names in certain regions. Um, that's tough. That's a bugaboo for a lot of, uh, fantasy writers. We tried. <laughs> Well, like in, in your defense and in, and in Steve's defense, you know, there are times when you read an early fantasy novel, uh, quite often a debut novel by someone and they go like, here's our character, Steve and our character, Cam and our character, Bob and our character, Garkthar the Destroyer and our character, uh, Carl. And you had, they all grew up in the same village. Uh, <laughs> I hope we didn't go. <laughs> go quite that far in our oversights no uh, but it's it yeah. is it's i think it's something that is very very difficult for fantasy authors because um and i i think you saw a bit of this with one of the characters kyle and people will go but that's such a modern name and you go well hang on a sec there's a character quick ben his name's ben and whiskey jack like his character is jack you know these names exist but also Kyle is mm -hmm. only common in certain areas in the world. Oh, hang on. Oh, yeah, you're back. It's a, it's a, uh, yeah, it's a, yeah, yeah, that. And also, um, in the, in uh, sort of, a, um, if we're looking at a pseudo medieval, non industrialized 
uh, non-bureaucratized world, people change their names all the time. Uh, they can, uh, names change and, and people take on um, nicknames that they are known by in, in a certain group that people outside that group don't know that nickname and would never use it. Uh, and so there's, there's a lot of layering to people's identities in their names. And we, I hope that we were also cognizant of that when we were writing. Like inside a, a squad, they would have a, a nicknames for each other. But people who are outside that squad, we're not allowed to use those nicknames. Uh, <laughs> so there are things like that. Yeah, it, it, it is something that is very difficult for fantasy authors because one of them uh, springs to mind, and I think it was a book by is it James Eng called The Wolf Age, and he has his character Morlock Ambrosius arrive uh, in this place, and it's a werewolf city, and all and there's he's done this brilliant structuring of um, the society of werewolves and how they organize themselves and and how they organize their sort of uh, hierarchies. But they all have werewolf names, which are all lupine signs. So as a reader, I am looking at these 23 letter long, just gibberish going, I, I can't, you are now called Susan. And I literally renamed all of the characters because I couldn't, hear their name in my head because they were all lupine sounds. Um, and I think that takes that that verisimilitude and that authenticity just that slightly too far because it is still meant to be a novel. Yeah, I mean, that's that uh, points for going for the legitimacy. <laughs> but you, you know, might want to think about your readers too. And, uh... <clears throat> That's the same for languages as well, of course. We can't... Sorry, I had to choke. <laughs> we can't go all full on in our uh, language differentiations either. Yeah, and that's, I mean, it's its one of the, the weird things, say like a TV show like Discovery, uh, Star Trek, uh, the Star Trek universe. The Vulcans have one language. And you go, really? On that entire planet, there's only one language. And everyone, you know, seems to know English. Um, and when you think then of a fantasy world where you have all of these different nations, these different species, the all these different cultures, and yet they all go, oh, yeah, we can all speak common. <laughs> and it, it's one of those conceits of fiction writing that you go, yep, yeah, it is completely and utterly unrealistic, but we're going to go with it. Otherwise everyone has to walk around with a translator the entire time that's right uh douglas's famous fish the, the babel fish it's what we need yeah yeah it's one of the conceits of of the genre yeah um but i know there was a there's one of the the genre conceits that both you and and your partner in crime shamelessly worked into the world as a yes this is a rule of our world, and that's convergence. I'm sorry, that is such a bald-faced cheat. What? <laughs> How so? You say these things do not happen? I don't believe that. <laughs> but it's the whole, yeah, all of the characters in the world are aware that convergences happen. So that's how we build to a narrative climax, because it's not a narrative climax, it's a narrative convergence, and that's allowed. No, not everyone knows. <laughs> oh yeah, sorry, there's about like five characters who are unaware of it. <laughs> Only people who are aware of it are. <laughs> it's fate. It's, you know, it's, it's a lot of, it's been a lot of fun delving into this stuff. And I'm really happy that, that Philip and I are actually going to be going into um, your books in particular. Because I remember one of the, the first things that we talked about was I had read Night of Knives. And um, I had said to you that I was actually incredibly impressed by it. And um, I don't think you were expecting that coming from the, the arrogant little graduate student that I was. From, from a, a critic. <laughs> 
Um, and one of the, th the the thing that absolutely uh, blew my mind about it was here was a novel, novella, novel. It, it depends on the, the dividing line. But here was a novel that had all of the appearance, trappings, and feel of a solid, action-packed fantasy novel. And yet it all occurs in the time frame of one night, the Night of Knives. And to my, to my knowledge, and I could be mistaken on this, but I can't think of any other fantasy novel where everything happens in a single night. And the the fact oh. that you managed to pull that off and pull it off convincingly, I just I looked at that and went, I've never a never seen it before, and was just really impressed. Well, thank you. The that was an uh, almost an exercise uh, because I had been uh, a bit stung by some of the criticisms of uh, of the genre that it can only produce these monstrously huge door stoppers that sprawl across you know, um, thousands and hundreds of thousands of years. And it's impossible for a fantasy writer to limit themselves to a, say, um, a piece of time that a contemporary literary write, writer would, would deal with. And so you picked one night, one location, and went, yeah, screw you guys, it's done. <laughs> That's just the, the exterior plotting of course there's interiority with it takes us <clears throat> uh, elsewhere well yes but i didn't want to get into uh, a spoiler discussion about that because i'd like to leave okay. that okay um, well we'll leave that for a, a later but i i just wanted to flag it because it is it is something that um i thought was just so incredibly impressive and illustrates your your chops as a writer if you will because it isn't something that that is common and it isn't something that is easy to do. So uh, just wanted to mention it. It was fun. It was yes. fun. Yeah. Um, so to get back to some of the, the gaming stuff. Now, I personally have been privy to some of the conversations that you and Steve have had. Um, I've been very privileged to, to sit in on some of those. And at other times, you've both turned to me and gone, AP, go away now. We have, we have private Malazan business to talk about, and you're not allowed to hear this. That's right. That's right. Our private club. Yeah. <laughs> um, but one of the, the things that always came across in, in your discussions when, when I was privy to them was the, the care and attention to detail uh, that you had for ensuring that the world and the characters were treated well, that they weren't just throwaways. Um, yeah, that's, <clears throat> that's the responsibility of a, of a writer is um, to, you know, you should be treating your characters with uh, the all, all the due respect. Um, so to ask a question then, uh, as long as it doesn't interfere with, say, future writing that you're doing, because we'll talk about that in a second, um, or uh, future writing that maybe that Ericsson is doing, was there a, uh, is there an anecdote from gaming that you could give us about, say, a time that uh, you absolutely flummoxed Steve or he absolutely flummoxed you, uh, either you GMing or, or he, uh, he was GMing? Well, <clears throat> yeah, there were, uh, we, I, I hope that uh, <laughs> I managed to th throw a, a lot of uh, sucker punches his way and, and vice versa. Um, things like uh, surprises, um, you know, the, 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 the classic movie th moment of, I didn't see that coming, uh, that, that, that sort of thing. Um, because it, in reading, uh, in, in going back through a lot of these books, I've actually been surprised by the amount of horror that actually has crept into it that I didn't notice on my first read of a lot of the Malazan work, that there's a great deal more of these horror elements um, from the, the ridiculous to the sublime. Like it's the whole gamut of horror from sort of almost like the hammer horror influences all the way to young Frankenstein. 
um, that appear in it. So like at the, the very beginning of Dancer's Lament, obviously that scene and that sequence of him going through into that tunnel and, and then it's the, the surprise moment there. And I just, it's played for humor, but also works intrinsically within the narrative. Um, and uh, <clears throat> the horror element as well, I hope. Well, uh, yes. Yeah. Um, it's hard to, I, I mean, I hope that we manage to balance those things in a way that's smooth and, uh, and, and in a way offsetting each other. I think it's too much of one tone is, is um, uh, you get tired of it. So it's nice to refresh the palette uh, with a, a new theme or a new tone coming in that can uh, then perhaps cast a different light on things that had just happened. Uh, <laughs> uh, things like that. Um, but how then, because obviously with some of the horror elements, uh, from some of the horror elements of the games, I know they were played almost for laughs within the games rather than truly horrific. So obviously when you've adapted that or uh, exported it from the game memories that you have to bring into the narrative world that you've created, which is clearly distinct, how do you deal with that tonal shift? Yeah, we had to uh, <clears throat> tone some, some of things down, certainly, because uh, we were only, our audience was only each other at that point. Uh, so we could get away with a lot. Uh, yeah, but now, though, we were shifting to uh, a more general, broader audience. We had to keep our audience in mind. Uh, and so I hope that that guided a lot of our, our decisions about making those shifts. Um, because wasn't, uh, it, I mean, it seems very strange now, but wasn't the, the character originally called Dr. Wu? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> originally, yes. <laughs> Which, you know, it's... He decided like, he needed more... Um, are um, a, a more of sort of a stupid, uh, august name. So he made everyone call him Doctor. <laughs> it, <laughs> which, you know, it, it fits with the personality that he has, but it's, I'm trying to think of, you know, Doctor doesn't exist as an honorific within the world. <laughs> no. But we knew what he meant. Oh, <laughs> uh, so it's it's little things like that that you know when I first found out, I just was sort of going like, I actually sat there trying to work out and think of is there anyone who actually is called Doctor in that world? And I was thinking back through all of the different books to see if someone had no. been referred to as a Doctor. No, maybe in some. Uh, philosophy department in some <laughs> city <laughs> in some <laughs> they might have found found that word and stumbled upon it but uh, no uh, yeah and then we had fun with that and and the the horror as well um, playing with playing with genres in, in a way yeah um <laughs> But it's thinking about, um, I know you'd said that, that Steve had drawn the maps and you'd said that like Robert E. Hard had been like a significant influence and clearly Hard must have been more of an influence on the, on the type of story and not the f format of the world because the Hyborian maps originally just made like absolutely no sense whatsoever. So was that not you know, looking at that, given your training, because, you know, you're archaeologist, anthropologist, lit, uh, and you're well-traveled. Looking at those maps, do you not get a headache looking at them and going, that is just all wrong? I don't even bother with that. <laughs> that was just this ridiculous effort to, you know, stick what he had in mind or had done on, 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 on a, a European backdrop, right? Western Europe. In Northern Africa, actually, up to uh, the Urals, I think, <laughs> on the eastern boundary. Uh, that was just silly. Uh, so that had no no role. It was more um, the idea of lost world. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
that's one of the things I loved about his his you know, Hyborian age is that you could go tramping off and find a lost city or uh, a civilization completely different from the one that you came from, and it was you could uh, go off an adventure, so to speak. You know, and, um, that conceit was one of the things, at least, that I drew from his his work. Um, because I mean, it is something that with the the mapping of the earth and our knowledge of where everything is on the earth and we went from you know you could travel and find this long lost culture this idea of exploration of finding a lost land and then we went, well we find all the lost lands and then it was like ah but there's a hollow earth and if you dig down into these places there are all these new lands and then it's oh well we could go to the stars and we're constantly trying to find places that we have never explored and for me fantasy has has occupied that that it's this idea these secondary worlds it doesn't matter if they're in our universe or in a different universe that that need for exploration is sort of fulfilled in that i think so <clears throat> it, it serves a, a per, that purpose uh now for some i mean uh it's a wide readership um and, and uh, i'm grateful for that but i think it does serve that that uh that need that imaginative need um so you did after uh the the archaeology and then you'd you'd studied and graduated the creative writing programs and then you ended up taking a bit of uh, a, a jaunt around the planet for a bit that you didn't just stick around in canada yeah we went i went to the u.s to do uh post-grad stuff uh, and uh, masters in creative writing, and up, up here in, in Alaska, uh, and um, met my wife, and then the two of us went off to uh, Thailand for about four years. We were in that region. Actually, we only meant to go for one year, but uh, but we both enjoyed it a lot, so we stayed for four. <laughs> Although one of those years, I was in Japan. So, um, I'm. Was, was Jerry still in Thailand that you were in Japan? And yeah. Was... yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, that must have been tough. That was tough. We were both supposed to go, but one of the positions fell through. The, and uh, Jerry was offered a, a good job in, in uh, Thailand. Uh, and so she stayed and I went. Uh, and that was tough. Uh, because obviously that was back before we had things like this, where you could just do the, the Zoom call to, to catch yeah. up on a... Uh, yeah. Was it a lot of furious letter writing? <laughs> I think so, yes. Uh, I, and that's um, how it used to be for, you know, for so long for everybody. Um, I'm just saddened now that we're frightened of sending people to go to, say, Mars, for example. And, and the, the, the argument is, oh, well, it's like a six-month journey. My goodness, that's horrific. And then I think about <clears throat> uh, New England whalers who went on voyages of four years sailing around the world away from home you know we're capable of doing things like that well don't we have like, even like submariners today like they go out for long extended periods at sea where you know they're they're out at sea it's not like yeah stop it off for parties and places <laughs> I just hope that we're just not too too timid you know, and, or coddled now. Um, so I did have a question, and in your defense, your later books didn't do it, but why did all of your early books have a ship on the cover? <laughs> As if I had any choice in the matter. <laughs> That's mean. I thought it was like some note that you were sending into them. Make sure you put another ship on the cover. That's my brand. This is where AP knows it. What uh, authors like Steve and I, oh, we, we get a, an, uh, an email from our editor saying, here's your cover. What do you think? We go, oh, well, uh, I don't know. I don't know about those breast cups. I don't know. It's, it's it's a fantastic ship. I really, really like it. You do realize this one's set in a jungle. <laughs> well, there is a ship in it. I mean, maybe they just decided to go for theme. You know, that, that was, that was going to be the theme. 
Uh, and unfortunately, the one I'm working on now, there's lots of ships in it. So. You don't say. Oh, isn't that funny? Of course, <laughs> in the, uh, ye, ye olden times, if you wanted to get around, you had to be in a ship. That's... Yes, but you're not limited to that because it's a magical world with warrens. Ah, right. Why, don't, why aren't they all riding giant birds or something? <laughs> <laughs> Just take an eagle. Apparently, it's the best way to solve everything. It, it swoops in and saves you every time. Uh. <laughs> but no, that must be, you know, it, in some respects, it must be so nice to see what had been uh, a pastime and a great passion to be able to walk into a bookstore and see elements of that that hobby are now up there on a bookshelf in a bookstore with your name on it that you know people are going in to, to buy your books that must be a good feeling oh it's a, you know, it's a great privilege to to be able to do something that you that you love and have a passion for and oh uh, yeah i'm grateful for that that's for sure and you know we're having met steve and uh we happened to hit it off i mean we could have hated each other and tried murdering each other in our tent i suppose that <laughs> that could have happened <laughs> To, to be honest, Cam, I'm fairly sure there must have been one night where it came very close. Oh, yeah. <laughs> For either of us. <laughs> Those long, lonely nights on the dig, and you go, Erickson, if you keep snoring, I am going to kill you. <laughs> yeah, or vice versa, that's for sure. Um, and uh, But we um, found that, you know, we could... We could uh, immediately sync on a lot of our uh, goals for what we wanted to do with, with the genre, with, with fantasy. Uh, the elements we wanted to keep were all similar. The elements that we didn't like were similar. Uh, and so they're, <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, but it's, and you also share that in your writing that you both write duos very, very well. And I've always assumed that the reason that you do those sort of duos and, and two, uh, two person sort of friends or uh, groups is based primarily on that gaming experience that you had, that it was, you imagine one of them is you playing and one of them is, is Steve and you, you can almost put yourself in that position. Yeah, that and, and uh, the fictional problem of, of, of the lone character with no one to talk to. That's <laughs> how am I going to explain things? <laughs> so. Just, just the, the castaway and the volleyball problem. So. <laughs> it's, Shakespeare just had them walk around and talk. You're allowed to do it. Have, have a character go past going, is he monologuing again? That's right. <laughs> well, he, if you look at Shakespeare, he had lots of pairings as well. Yeah. It's Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. And, uh, um, but I mean, it is, I mean, it's a very, uh, obviously it is a technique that lots of authors use. It's just, um, it is one of those things that stands out, I think, particularly in yourself and Steve's work, because some of those pairings just work so well that they feel entirely natural. And it is very rare for uh, fantasy characters to feel natural in their dialogue. That the, I think for an author to do that, and there are authors who do it and, and who do it very, very well. But for an author to do that, they really have to know their characters and know the other characters, both characters, sort of inside out and to be able to imagine that response. And I think uh, part of your experience with Steve, but also your experience gaming in general, I, is, a, is a tool that maybe is useful for that. Mm. I think it was a good education for dialogue. It was uh, gaming, I mean, uh, and, and um, <clears throat> realizing what, works and what doesn't work and uh, and how how to uh, get things across you know in a shorthand uh between characters uh, learning all of that uh it, i think gaming helped a lot in that uh, that's a vice of the of the genre though stilted dialogue that's uh <laughs> that's a tough one it's even bleeds into the um the cinema yeah, um, it's sometimes you go, oh, oh, is this the exposition scene? Fascinating. Please yeah. go on. The, the... I'll get my popcorn now. 
Oh God. I'm having flashbacks to I was I was doing some narrative analysis of Star Trek Discovery. So I've been going through each episode and and you go, Oh, this is a brilliant scene. Why 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 are you doing this? Stop. Stop not no, no. You it was going so well. <laughs> <laughs> there, there was a scene now. Okay, without telling you too much about it, imagine because I know that you you write science fiction as well. Um, so imagine you're on an alien planet. You are a trained first contact specialist. You've been trained to handle a first contact situation, and this alien is a cloud of glowing lights. And you can't communicate with it yet. There's no, it doesn't, it doesn't emit any sound. You, you keep saying things, it doesn't seem to be responding. And in this scene, this guy goes, stand back everyone, I'm a first contact specialist. I've been trained. We mean you no harm, we come in peace. And then he, he has, takes his bare arm and he shoves his fist right into the middle of this glowing cloud. Ouch. I looked at this and went, so this is the universal form of first contact. Hello, we come in peace. Now have a good fisting. And then that explains, that explains the anal probing from all of these people who get kidnapped on Earth, because apparently this is the universal greeting. We just, we're just ignorant of this convention. It's... <laughs> you write science fiction. You... Like, how would you go about, like, if you saw that scene, if someone handed you that scene in a story, like, what is your reaction to that? Uh, well, first, I would wonder about this swarm. I mean... <laughs> yes! I don't know. I don't know about these glowing swarms. But tell you what, let's put our bare flesh into the middle of it just to see what happens. Oh dear. <laughs> yeah. So, sorry to, to digress, but so <laughs> we, um, you're, you're currently working on the Gistal. Uh, is that Gistal, sorry. I, I will forever die on the hill of both you and Steve pronounce things incorrectly and I am right. We're always incorrect. <laughs> <laughs> I think one of these days, one of the two of you is going to punch me for saying that. Um, but so you, you're working on that. And clearly, obviously, um, 2020 and COVID and how that spilled into this year, that's had a bit of a, an impact on, on your time scales and, and what you're doing. Yeah, it's pushing um, things back. Um, but, it's, it's going to get done, but uh, like everything, it's, it's being delayed. <laughs> and that it's it's amazing how the the pandemic really has had these massive repercussions and and things that you go oh but that should give you more time for something and you go no it it doesn't it suddenly my time is is taken up with a whole lot of other things that I never would have had to deal with before. Yeah, we've got you know speaking of connectivity we've, in in the household we've got my my wife who's teaching her classes at the university on Zoom. Uh, We've got my three boys who are all at the same time zooming into their classes at schools. So that's four people trying to get online at the same time. Uh, and it's 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 a horror show. <laughs> that oh that that can't be <laughs> can't be good. Um, but you and the family are keeping safe, which is good. Yes. Um, uh, and that's it. It is, it is a concern <laughs> because I don't, the, the plans of meeting up every year and, and uh, where we try to sort of get together and like they've all been thrown by the wayside. And so uh, getting an opportunity to see friends even via Zoom is, is fantastic. Oh, well, that's true. That's um, true. Thank you so much for, for the, the opportunity. <laughs> so um, we'll, we'll kind of, we'll wrap up in a second here, but we talked a little bit about your influences, you know, in the, the books and things. Um, are there any films, because there's 
quite often a cinematic quality to your writing. Oh, hang on a sec. Um, moments. Right, Steve. Yeah, yeah Steve. Yeah. <laughs> We're just finishing up the interview. You, would you like to say hello to everyone? Sure. <laughs> I thought you said, come in at 10 minutes. <laughs> I said we were we were recording until it. <laughs> oh dear, technical difficulties. Well, everyone. Hey. hey. <laughs> I mean, you sent me a note and said come in with ten minutes left, and so and say hello. So here I am. But I can leave again. That's easy. No. No. <laughs> oh. What? 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 What did I misunderstand? We will hey, talk Steve. about it later, you hoser. Oh, AP, you can you can ask uh, Steve. You were asking about uh, incidents and surprises and things that happened. Uh, ask him about the time I stole Rake's sword from him. Ask, ask Steve about that. But, but hang on a sec. Hang on a sec. Let's Not do this happy. now. We have him. We have him on the line now. Oh. <laughs> So who stole Rick's sword? In gaming, he we did a uh, whole arc where he was to 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 get Dragnapera to 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 attain it for Rick. And, it was uh, either Eric, Lady Envy or it was Osirk. Was it Osirk? Yeah, right. And uh, right after he managed to get it, he gives it to Osirk to to keep for yeah. a little while, <laughs> and Lady Envy takes it from him. Yeah. He was, he was, you were not happy. <laughs> I, was, I was seriously ticked. Seriously ticked. Lady Envy was great. She just, um, perpetual foil. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, right. Well, I will finish up the recording here. Um, so, Cam, thank you very much for, for doing this interview. We will see you again uh, with Philip Chase when we start going through the novels of the Malazan Empire. Steve, Great, thank you. Steve, oh, always, yeah. good to, always good to see you. <laughs> Bye, everyone. <laughs>